Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Better late than never. I was uh, doing a lot of reading today. So, uh, excuse me. Uh, I just got caught up reading, and so, so I, <laughs> I couldn't stop. And then I decided, I hardly ate anything yesterday. I decided I need to eat breakfast before I do this class. If I didn't eat breakfast, we would be on time. So, here we are. And we had uh, decided we're going to continue talking about Balaram. Correct? You remember? So, that's what we're going to do. Hare Krishna. I think maybe today we won't do kirtan because we started late. Oh, yes. We also have questions left over. Um, we have questions left over from yesterday. Right? Correct? Okay. If I move over... So you can see, Prabhupada. Okay. I have the questions on my computer. And so we had lots of questions yesterday, and I had a meeting, and I couldn't stay beyond the time. We're trying to stop at a, after an hour and a half, and so... We had so much discussion yesterday. So, I don't know how this question came up. It's not exactly completely relevant to the discussion we were having, but I'm going to read it. Which way is the most effective way to control the senses. How can I be coherent with my desire? No, it's, it's actually we were talking about this. With my desire to humbly serve Krishna through his pure devotee when my mind is still weak and interrupts, making me think that I don't advance and get frustrated. So there's two, two questions here. How to control oneself and how not to get frustrated when one doesn't control oneself. And I, I briefly answered this by saying... Studying Prabhupada's books is going to be one of the most potent things you can do to correct this problem of controlling your senses. Because, as I've often said, what, one of the things you need to control your senses is pure, pure, clean, strong intelligence. And by reading Prabhupada's books, you'll get pure, clean, strong intelligence. It will give you will give you what you need. It will give you the intelligence. As the Prabhupada said, intelligence is the next door neighbor of the soul. So intelligence, pure spiritual intelligence trans is transmitting that. We could say it's transmitting everything you need to be to advance and control yourself. So as in doing anything, you need a reason. So what's your reason? And your reason is given on every page of Prabhupada's books. He'll convince you that this life should be dedicated to Krishna. So the problem is we don't remember our last lives. So under illusion, we think like this is everything. And we think in the 50, 100 years we have here, we should get as much sense gratification as possible. And we've been programmed to think the more sense gratification we get, the more successful we are. And even though you might say, no, I know that's not true. But actually, if you look at your life and think about it, that's how we've been programmed. So when there's opportunity for sense gratification, we think, yeah, well, that's what you're supposed to do. <clears throat> get as much as you can before you leave your body. That's the idea. So that's, that's the programming. So we're all programmed like that. Uh -huh. I will turn the volume down. Better? Is it better now? 
You know, yesterday I was doing a class and they said it was too quiet. <laughs> but that was going through USB. Um, okay, is this better? Better? I think it should be. So, I've said this so many times. And the reason I've said this so many times is because it's being neglected. That we don't realize the power of reading Prabhupada's books. And I think, I think perhaps sometimes devotees don't read them because they know what the books will do to them and they're almost afraid to have that operation. Like I know if I read Prabhupada's books a lot and regularly, it's going to put me in a certain state of consciousness, which is going to make me want to give up things that I'm attached to. And if I'm attached to those things, and in the back of my mind I'm thinking, I really don't want to give them up, then subconsciously there's this thought, and I really don't want to read too much because the books are going to tell me to give up the things that I'm attached to. It's like if I say, Marcelo, let's talk. And you're going to say, I don't know if I want to talk because you're probably going to tell me to stop doing something I like to do. So I'd rather not talk. Something like that. Right? You understand. You understand. Yeah. But still, we need those books. And if we feel that way, it's all the more reason that we need those books. That's another understanding so that controlling our controlling ourselves you need a reason to control yourself i was just speaking to john yesterday and we were speaking about addictions and he said there's a method in help helping people overcome addictions which has been proven has been shown to be very successful and that is to help a person visualize, meditate on what they want, what their goals are. Because when they do that, then they realize as long as they have their addictions, they're not going to achieve those goals. So, what are your goals, Marcelo? Be clear on your goals. And then, or all of us, be clear on our goals in Krishna consciousness. And then, automatically, you start to see what's getting in the way of those goals. If you're not clear about your goals in Krishna consciousness then maybe attachments will be stronger. You become more clear. What do you want? Where do you want to be five years from now, ten years from now? What's your goal? You want to be a pure devotee. So that being said, you start to understand or you'll start to see that there's certain things in your life that are, are going to get away, get in the way of that goal. And so when that goal becomes more inspiring, it's something you want more and more as the goal becomes stronger. That's what I'm trying to say. As the goal becomes stronger, then your ability to control yourself, uh, your ability to do what's necessary to achieve the goal becomes stronger. It's a very important point. Those two things, those two things can help you tremendously. Very focused on your goal. And then it becomes obvious what's getting in the way of it. And regular reading of Prabhupada's books so your intelligence is very clear. And so that was the first part of your question. And the second part of your question is, how can I not lose enthusiasm while I'm waiting to become purified? Well, I have two answers for this. And if we're not sufficiently, if we're not engaged in Krishna consciousness in a way that we're making some advancement, we're making some progress, then it's quite easy to become discouraged. I mean, it's just a fact. I can't, I can't. If you're not making advancement, why would you be encouraged after 10 years of not making? It's like you're working on a at a business and after 10 years you haven't made any money. You probably would think, I think we should start a different business or we should give up on this business or I should retire. Well, something like that. We have to be making advancements. So if you ask the question, how can I be not lose enthusiasm and be steady while I'm still not controlling myself? The answer is unless there's a sufficient amount of control that enables you to make some advancement progressively, it's going to be difficult. You're going to become discouraged. 
if you follow sufficiently so that you can be assured that if I continue this way, I'll make advancement, then you'll be okay. That's one answer, and there's, there's another answer. The second part of the answer is that don't expect to be more advanced than you are. And we talked about this recently. You're learning an instrument, so you've been practicing a few months. Uh, just like last night, some of you were in our class, and Hovey just came over while I was giving class. So I said, well, why don't you? We can give class together. It was in Spanish. So Hovey and I discussed a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. And then at the end, Hovey played the keyboard and sang a song. So he's amazing. He's like a musical genius. So I play the keyboard, and I don't practice at all. I just play it for kirtans, and my practice is while I'm playing. And so I could be lamenting I'm, I'm not as good as him. But according to the level of practice, I'm as good as you're going to be for that level of practice. So similarly, sometimes when we, we see other devotees who are more advanced, yeah, they've been practicing for like 35 years. Or even if you say, no, the devotee's only been practicing the same time, same amount of time I've been practicing. Well, have they been practicing better? Were they more advanced in their last life? So, you know, our advancement is, is we have to see it as often relative to the effort we're making. You know, how good are your rounds? How much are you reading? How good is your sadhana? What service are you doing? How do you spend your days? How do you spend your time? So if you, look at, if you look at all that and say, well, my rounds aren't good, I don't read much, and most of my day is working or just surfing the internet, and then you're lamenting why you're not making advancement. You're lamenting, you're looking at your condition and saying, oh, I have so many anarthas, etc., I'm not making advancement. Then we'll just look at what you're doing. And, and according to what you're doing, that's all you're going to get. It's like I go to the gym for five minutes a day, I lift a few weights, and I'm lamenting that I don't have big muscles. Well, if you're only going to exercise for five minutes a day, that's all you can expect. So I think sometimes devotees expect to have big muscles with, with five minutes of exercise. So it's something like that. So the third answer to this is that sometimes what happens is we are making advancement, but it's not perceptible. It's imperceptible to us because it's gradual and we don't notice it. But if you, for most of us, if we look back at our lives when we were very young devotees and we look at our lives now, we can see we're making advancement. And we're just, we want to make more. But the point is, that's okay, it's good you want to make more. But the point is, you can't, you can't have big muscles in five minutes. It takes, you know, half hour, hour a day of working out over a period of time. Then you'll have the big muscles or lose the weight or whatever it is. So that this question comes up a lot. There's a lot of um there's a lot of frustration. We all have this frustration of we want to be more advanced. And I think part of the frustration is we're expecting by now we, we would be more advanced. I mean, look at Ten years I've been chanting, I chant 16 rounds, follow the principles, I do everything, I do service, sadhana. And then I look at myself and it's, I think, I, it doesn't seem like I've made much advancement. But one way to look at it is we're better off than we were before we were devotees, so at least be grateful for that. And it, advancement is a bit cumulative because the more you advance, the more you advance. Which means is as you progress in Krishna consciousness, it becomes easier to advance. So your progress in the beginning, it seems like you make a lot of progress. Krishna gives you mercy. Then after five, six, seven months, three months, you start doing the hard work and then it seems like it slows down. But once you get higher into the stage, obviously in the stage of Nista or Ruchi, you can imagine... The stage of Nishta or Ruchi, there's not a lot of impediment. And in Ruchi, there's a lot of attraction, excuse me, a lot of taste. Ruchi means taste and Nishta means steadiness. So obviously, once you're in the stage of steadiness and then in the stage of Ruchi, 
there's not much getting in the way as there is on lower stages. So your advancement is faster. So it's kind of like gravitational, gravitational pull of the ro- of the rocket taking off. You know, it, it requires more energy. Once it gets into outer space, it drops one of its engines. So when you're on the stage of nishta, your advancement is going to be faster. Getting to that stage may be more difficult and slower, and you may lose enthusiasm. But when you get to the stage of nishta and then ruchi, especially ruchi, it's very, very fast at that point. It's kind of like, for those of you who have ever started a business, in the first few years, it's slow, it's difficult, you're building up, and, and sometimes all your work just explodes at some point and everything takes off. It's like all the seeds sprout and grow into trees. But it may, you know, it usually takes like three years or so. And that's what I've been told. Or they say when you open a restaurant, don't expect to make any money for the first year or maybe more. So it's like that, you know, it's, it's, it's the analogy is it's a creeper, it's sprouting. And the other analogy is, I think it's a bamboo. It doesn't grow for like so many years. And then one year after five or 10 years or whatever it is, 99 years, I forget. Not that long. Maybe after 10 years, it's like this big. Nine years, it's this big. And like the 10th year, it's like grows 10 feet or something like that. So sometimes it's like that also. And that's that's like the stage of Ruchi, where things just take off. So if you don't, if you don't have patience and enthusiasm, then you don't get to the stage of nishta where things will take off and ruchi. So it's kind of like we have to we have to somehow or other follow Krishna consciousness well enough that we can be steady, enthusiastic, and optimistic, so that we'll get to these higher stages, and then it becomes easier. So two ways not to become frustrated is do your best and realize. Whatever you're doing is your best. You're on where you are is the only place you can be right now if you're doing your best. And if you're not doing your best, do your best. And then accept that I'm on a certain stage. And as long as I'm on that stage, there will be certain symptoms. And and I won't have the symptoms maybe that I'd like because I'm not on a higher stage. But when I get to that higher stage, I will have them. Okay. Priya Priyam Priya Priyam Vadha Priyam Vadha. I want to say Priya Madhava. If I call you Priya Madhava, don't don't mind. It's easier for my tongue to say. Priyam Priyam Vadha. Priyam Vadha, yeah. Could she uh, Priyam Vadha is asking, could someone be both extremes of cognitive dissonance? overly arrogant and overly aware of the faults and be aware that they're arrogant and feel worse and hopeless. Uh, I mean, anything's possible, but generally arrogance is the opposite polar end of, what are you saying here? Feeling bad and hopeless. So we have to go back a little bit and we were talking about cognitive dissonance, which means you, you're acting out of alignment with your values and you don't know it. So she's saying, could you be arrogant and overly aware of your faults? Well, by definition, arrogance means you're not aware of your faults. If you were, you wouldn't be arrogant. Um, arrogant, you know, when someone's arrogant, it's like they have this intense need, unhealthy need to be appreciated. Like it's just off the charts, off the charts need to be appreciated. And a lot of times, people who are arrogant who need to be appreciated are doubting themselves, and that's why they need to be appreciated. Interesting, right? And um, be aware that they're arrogant and feel worse and hopeless. Be aware that you're arrogant and feel bad about it. Of course, it's possible. Any any kind of combination of dysfunction is possible. I was just generalizing and saying most arrogant people are not aware of their faults. And we could say arrogant people are not aware. They become arrogant to not be aware. It's too painful. You know, if if you have a low image of yourself, sometimes 
arrogance is is the so-called cure. It's not the cure, but it's the measure people take to not face their inadequacies. And they can't face their inadequacies. They become depressed. So arrogance is kind of like make-believe like I'm the greatest. And, you know, in their honest moments, they can realize they're doing that. Um, And then they would feel bad. And feeling bad is not bad. If feeling bad helps you. And when you become a devotee, there's so many things potentially to feel bad about because you'll compare yourself to a pure devotee. And in comparing yourself to a pure devotee, yeah, then you'll see, oh, I'm pretty bad. If you compare yourself to everybody else, you may not feel so bad. And so sometimes when people become devotees, they start feeling worse about themselves because now they're comparing themselves to something pure. Whereas before, if you compare yourself to the average person, you probably just fit in, right? Uh, A lot of devotees are very concerned and sometimes upset about their inability to control their senses, but compared to the rest of the world, their level of control is probably greater than most people. But compared to the standard we want for ourselves, compared to pure devotees, it's not, so we become a little discouraged. Uh, Have you noticed that? That, like before you're a devotee, you may do so many things that don't bother you, and you may think, actually, they're good. And I'm enjoying with women. That's good. Everybody, if all my friends are like, they respect me for that. And I, I get drunk a lot. I can drink more beers than other people. My friends are respecting me for that. Do I go home at night and say, I drank more beers than everyone else? And thinking there's something wrong with me? I think, no, I'm good. Um, I'm enjoying with women. No, that's good. That means I'm attractive. I've got sex appeal. But when you become a devotee, all of that becomes horrible for you. I'm doing these things. You're doing the things that everybody does. Now you feel horrible horrible because you realize it's wrong. So that's something you have to be able to, you know, work out and deal with. It's it's relative. Huh. So I hope that answers your question. I'm I'm not 100% sure that's what you were asking. I think you're asking, can you be arrogant and at the same time feel worse? Yeah, you would if you realize you're arrogant. But arrogance and low self-esteem, arrogance is is often just covering low self-esteem. So maybe in an honest moment you realize that you're just pretending. And... um, you know, low self-esteem is, 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 often, is often nourished by concern about what other people think about us. And to be a devotee, you really, it's really not good to be too concerned about what the pe- people in general think about you because they think you're crazy, basically. And you're really stepping out of line from the norm. So if, you, if you're too worried about what they think about you, it can be problematic. I mean, we're worried in the sense that we want to spread Krishna consciousness. We don't want them to think we're crazy or anything. And even amongst devotees, if you're too worried, you know, do devotees respect me? Do they think I'm Krishna conscious? What if they find out I'm not? That's also an impediment. And low self-esteem may have something to do with that. And I, I... I think if you're trying your best, then why should you care about what other people think? Because you can't do any better. You can't. And if if they don't like your level of Krishna consciousness, it's really their problem, not yours. And it's more of a defect on their part. I'm doing my best. This is this is who I am. I wish I were better, but this is who I am now, and I'm trying to be better. And all of us are on different levels. You know, you have devotees who took sannyas when they were 22. They're still sannyasis. That's amazing. Like, how many people can do that? And you, and some men may think, I, I would like to do that, but I can't. Okay, I'm doing my best. I can't. And so you make peace with that. This is, this is just who I am. I'm doing my best. 
And if other people aren't happy with that, and I care about that, that's going to be a problem for me. So we shouldn't. It, it, we we should care what we should care what our mentors think, our counselors, our gurus. You know, we want to please them. We want to know we're doing the right thing. But to care too much about what the general population of devotees think about me can be very bad for my Krishna consciousness and very bad for my psychology. And and it's. It's not that important. Of course, we want to please the Vaishnavas, but this is this is not about pleasing the Vaishnavas. This is about pleasing our egos, basically. Oh, they think I'm great, then my ego is, you know, it's all blown up and I feel good. We, we've talked a lot about the fact uh, of, um, of what pleases Krishna. And we have said that, it, Prabhupada said, if you can please Krishna, what else could you ever want to accomplish in this world if you, if you can do that? And if by your humble service you can please Krishna, why would you want or need anyone else's appreciation or, or confirmation? The only reason would be is that there's some you know, insecurity in yourself where you think, you know, I'm not really good and I need people to tell me that. And these things have all been, uh, these things have all been, we've been affected by the society we live in because it puts so much emphasis on looking good. How do you look? How are you dressed? What are your grades? Where do you live? Where do you work? It's all about acceptance. Acceptance is a, it's a very, very big need, but it can be very problematic. You know, I try my best, I do my service. People may or may not appreciate. We should be satisfied in knowing, well, I did my best. This is who I am. I'm trying my best. I'm trying to chant my rounds as best I can. Sometimes they're not very good, but it's the best I can do. And we told that story many times. It's such a beautiful story where one devotee, Sri Giriraj Maharaj, was asking Prabhupada, he said, you know, when I chant, my mind wanders. Is that an offense? Because distraction is an offense. And Prabhupada just asked one question. He said, are you trying to control your mind? And Giriraj Swami said, yes, I'm trying to control my mind. And Prabhupada said, then it's not an offense. So I think that's a very important point. Because just, to, just imagine... You're trying to do your best, and and that's considered an offense because it's not good enough. That would be that would drive drive all of us crazy. It's like, well, what's what's the use? I try my best, but my best isn't good enough. You know that scenario. You know, two people aren't getting along, and oh, you say I never do anything right. You're always complaining. My best isn't good enough. It's so frustrating when you've tried your best, and someone's not satisfied. But Krishna's not like that, and Prabhupada's not like that. And other people may be like that, but we shouldn't allow that to affect us. And oftentimes I tell devotees who, who deal with these issues, I say, you know, Krishna is not like, like, like sometimes we have a very, we have parents who are always demanding more and more and not satisfied and sometimes putting us down for not being good enough. And I always tell devotees, oh, Krishna's not like that. So you may be thinking, oh, I'm not good enough, this and that. And I said, but Krishna doesn't see you like that. He's, Krishna's not like a dysfunctional parent. A lot of times we think he is because <laughs> that's what we're used to. So it's important to know that. Krishna is, um, you know, Krishna appreciates, because Krishna's, because it's not a material thing. Krishna appreciates, you know, the sincerity. That's really what it's all about. Bhakti Uparitam, Patra Pushpam Palam Toyam. That verse, that's that verse is so important, especially if you have low self-esteem or you're dealing with self-esteem. That verse is really important for you. Offer me with love. Offer what? A tosi leaf. Well, that's pretty easy. That's not no great feat. Offer me a flower. Well, that's not a big thing. Water, that's even less than a flower. A leaf, push, patra, push, palam. A fruit, pretty easy to do. 
And, if, and you know, so it's like Krishna's not demanding. Oh, that leaf's not good enough for me. That flower is not good. That water is not good enough for me. Why didn't you get the oxygenated water with alkalinity uh, at pH 8.6? Take your water back. I don't want it. No, that's what people are like here. And so, sometimes I see devotees, they, they think Krishna's like that also. God doesn't love me. Why would he like me? You know, the, All you're saying is my parents didn't like me or my brother didn't like me or my teacher said I was stupid or whatever. You know, Someone told you. But, but Krishna's not like that. So I think that's important to understand. I mean, not that I think it's important. I think it's essential because this is a huge problem. And if you have this tendency... It's quite easy that it gets worse when you become a devotee because now, you know, if you if you didn't think you were smart, then you become a devotee and you do something stupid, then you think, I'm really stupid. Prabhupada has made it clear not to do this, and I did it. So it's like, you know, I've really fallen. I'm really low. I mean, I thought I was low till I became a devotee, and I never realized how low I was. So if you have that tendency... To put yourself down, wow, you know, become a devotee, it gives you all the, all the ingredients are there. You know, you can really put yourself down better than you've ever done before. And the problem is that, that I see that happens a lot. So there's, there's, um, it's really important to understand that Krishna is not judging you like you have been judged by others or you, and the way you're judging yourself is usually because of the way others judged you. It's not really how you're judging yourself. You think, oh, I'm seeing myself this way. It's usually because others saw you that way or you think others see you that way or society's telling you to be a certain way and you start making these judgments. But I could say, I'd say another thing about acceptance. Prabhupada was... 100% 100% accepting of his disciples as long as they were willing to try to serve him, to try to rectify their mistakes, to try to be sincere, to try to do what, you know, try their best. I say try. Try is not a good word because we say do it, don't try. But I'm using the word try here meaning that sometimes you can't do it perfectly. So all you can do is try. So... When Prabhupada saw devotees trying, then it's like, okay, fine. However bad, fallen, rascal you are. Look what I found. A jackpot. You will notice after October. Allergy season is over, is it September? But the pollen hasn't been bad lately. So I'm okay, more or less. So Prabhupada was very, very understanding, very forgiving, very compassionate, very tolerant of the mistakes his devotees made. And I, I when we were young devotees, we all made so many mistakes. And Prabhupada was very tolerant. Because if he saw that we were sincere, that he knew Krishna from within would guide us and we'd become better. So so generally, you wouldn't see that any devotee ever felt discouraged by Prabhupada, even if he chastised them. And, and although the guru is supposed to chastise, we see that Prabhupada didn't chastise a lot because he knew that it was difficult for most of us. And what we see predominantly is Prabhupada encouraged us in spite of our faults. And that's why everyone was so so in love with Prabhupada and so much wanted to serve him because they felt they felt so accepted by him. And he had every reason, you know, in, in a sense not to accept us. But he accepted us because we were sincere and he had mentioned that in different occasions that my disciples, they may not know so many things and they may not have the culture, but they'll do anything I ask. And he, Prabhupada appreciated that. That was a, the main qualification. So we may be rotten in so many ways, but, you know, and, and devotees 
will say, you know, I, I have low self-esteem, this and that. But that same devotee is willing to do anything their pre- temple president asks, their mentor asks, their six-year guru asks, their guru asks, Prabhupada. They're just like, okay, I'll do it. That's it. That, what more perfection do you want than that? I mean, if you're if you're ready to try your best to serve your superiors, then I mean you're as you're as good as you're gonna you know you're as good as you can get, and we need to see that. And so if we if we judge ourselves by other standards, then then it's very easy. I just think, yeah, I'm so low, I'm so bad, this and that. And then you'll ask, what about humility? Humility just means to see where I need to work, to see what to work on. Ar- when you're arrogant, you don't see it. That's the problem with arrogance. When you're humble, you see it. But humility is not a synonym for depression. And a lot of times, in the name of humility, we become depressed because we see what's wrong with ourselves. So we have to learn how to see what's wrong with ourself without becoming discouraged. And seeing what's wrong with ourself is actually good, obviously, because you can work on it, and if you don't see what's wrong, you can't. So if I find a fault in myself, oh, I sh- and in a sense, I should be happy. Oh, how's it going today, Prabhu? Fantastic. What happened? I realized that I have these three faults. It was an amazing day today. It was like one of the best days of my life. I never realized I had these faults. And the other devotees like, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm happy for you. You know That, that means you're becoming more humble because you're seeing your faults. Yeah, I feel really good about it. I can Now I know what to work on. and I'm, I'm like excited that I found these. That should be the attitude as opposed to, uh, so depressed. What happened? Oh, I'm such a bad devotee. In fact, I'm such a bad person. Why would anybody like me? Hmm. I'm so stupid. You know, yeah, that that is all. Uh, that's all unnecessary. Completely unnecessary. It's not. It's not part of Krishna consciousness. It's not part of what. It's not what Prabhupada has come to give us at all. Yeah, to quote about humility is not synonymous, is not a synonym for depression. Okay, I have to write it down. But I don't have anything to write. Oh, here's mine. Yeah, that's a hot topic. I, I mean, as you, as you notice what I talk about in the classes, as you can tell, it's, it's based on my counsel. I do lots of counseling People say, well, why do you get so many WhatsApps and so many emails? Well, a lot of it's just problems devotees have that you need help with. And so these classes, a lot of them are relating answers to problems that I get a lot. So I know that they're common. Humility is not a synonym for depression. Mahatma Uvacha, the Mahatma Purana, the Mahatma Skanda. Mahatma Purana, the Mahatma... Sam, no, the Mahatma Samhita, Mahatma said. The Mahatma Das Samhita, another one from the Mahatma Das Samhita. And I wouldn't have spent so much time discussing this if it wasn't a big problem. So just so you know, if I really get off on something... And it seems like, well, when's he going to get back to the verse? Or when's he going to quote the shloka? It's because it's a pretty pervasive problem. And it needs discussion. And and people who are challenged with this need to hear a lot again and again. And those of you who are not challenged with it need to hear it because you may realize later that, that you are challenged with it. And you didn't realize it. Okay. So this has... Um, we are supposed to go through yesterday's comments, but now we have more comments. Um, nice questions. Okay, I'm going to go back up. You guys are like the... Um, you guys are the Sindhu Prashna, the ocean of questions. Okay. 
No, it's good. That's what makes these classes. I think that's why we like these classes. Kamaniya says, it's easier to have patience when you have enthusiasm. And it's easier to have enthusiasm when you have patience. And until we have either, we have to make fake it till we make it. Yeah. As, as Prabhupada said, be enthusiastic even if you're not. Dance in the kirtan even if you don't feel like it. So there is um, there is deep wisdom to that and as actual psychological evidence that it actually works. And if you've and if you if you try that you'll see it works and 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 also well, let's say I need to be enthusiastic to accomplish anything and if I'm not enthusiastic at least if I fake enthusiasm something will get accomplished and, I, and if I think well I shouldn't fake it it's not real then I may not accomplish much so let's do it enthusiastic Yes, we're going to do it. And sometimes you have to say that even when it's something that's difficult for you or something you'd rather not do. You say, yes, we're going to do it. And interestingly enough, if you can fake the enthusiasm, oftentimes it becomes real. Okay, Marcelo, I got your reply. Thank you for your reply. So Puna Puna says, Puna Puna, is that your birth name or your initiated name? Because again and again, but what again and again? Pizza again, pizza Puna Puna, Krishna Puna Puna, Maya Puna Puna, what is it? <laughs> again and again, but we don't know what again and again is. You have to enlighten us. Puna Bariya, okay. <laughs> Again, I don't know what that means. Is it Bariya? I can't see. You'll have to explain it. So, Puna Puna, chewing the chewed, uh, Prahlad Maharaj, chewing the chewed again and again. Should I be happy? I left all bad habits after getting into Krishna consciousness and try to develop more new good habits? Or should I have the guilt that I did all the bad things after the understanding of Krishna consciousness? Interesting question. Um, well, you should have the guilt, but it should be short-lived. I did all these bad things, this was horrible. Enough guilt, so I'll never do it again. And be happy now that you're Krishna conscious. That's Prabhupada's answer. So it's not that we're afraid of guilt. We're just afraid of deep, prolonged guilt where it's unnecessary. So I look at my past life and think, yes, I did horrible things. Most of us Westerners, we ate meat. We engaged in illicit sex, intoxication. Probably the only principle we didn't break was gambling, but I guess sports is considered gambling. So we did good at, basically we grew up breaking the four regular principles. So then we become devotees, we look back and we feel bad. That I, you know, I did so many bad things and we regret it. So Prabhupada said that regret is, is um, it helps us tremendously. Because it's purifying. But it's not the kind of regret that makes you depressed. It's not the kind of regret that holds you back. It's just the kind of regret that chastens you. Yeah, I'll never want to do that again. Uh, I feel so bad that I did it. So it's that, that kind of guilt that I feel so bad that I did it, so I would never want to do it again. And then I'm so happy now I've become a devotee. I'm so happy I found this. I'm so happy I'm not doing all these things that I used to do. So yeah, so they go together. They're not mutually exclusive. And Sureshwar Dasa is asking, how and when can we check if Krishna is really pleased with us? Well, the simple answer is if the guru is pleased. Or one time <laughs> they asked Prabhupada, how do we know if you're pleasing you? Oh, I can find out from the temple president if he's pleased, if you're doing nicely. 
So there's the there's a transcendental system where, you know, if you do service nicely, Krishna knows and Krishna is pleased. So I think it goes back to the first answer. How do you know Krishna is pleased? You tr you try your best. You please your authorities. You serve Prabhupada's mission, and then you could know Krishna is pleased. He could be more pleased. You could do more. You could make a million people devotees. Yeah, that would be nice. You could make one person a devotee, Krishna's pleased. You could make one offering with devotion, Krishna's pleased. You can chant one holy name purely, Krishna's pleased. It's the, Prabhupada said it's not hard to please Krishna. And, okay, so this is this is a good point. We were quoting that Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam verse. Leaf, fruit, flower, water. So Prabhupada quoted that often and he would say, you know, these things are easy to get. Anybody can get them, anybody can do it. And the conclusion was, it's not difficult to please Krishna. So again, this material idea that it may be difficult, may be difficult to please my father. He is never pleased, no matter what I did. He is never happy. He always told me, you can do better. You know, So he was never pleased. And, you know, whatever I did, my mother didn't like. You know, I became a hippie. She didn't like that. And I shaved my head and became a devotee. She didn't like that. And then I got married, but she didn't like the girl I got married to. You know, it's like, so sometimes... We, these are all true stories. <laughs> yeah, uh, this happens to devotees, right? You know, they, they say, I try to please my parents, but they were never pleased. Whatever I did, they weren't pleased. So they bring that concept in and think Krishna's not pleased. And, but again, he's not like everybody else. He's not like your parents. Maybe that that is another one, Kamaniya. Krishna is not like your parents. Of course, you may have not, you may have nice parents, so then he would be like your parents. But if you have parents that were driving you crazy sometimes, that Krishna's not like that. So, please the guru, Krishna's pleased. So please the guru also means please the senior Vaishnavas. P uh, serving ISKCON, do something to further ISKCON directly, pleases Prabhupada. Distributing Prabhupada's books, distributing the holy name, distributing prasadam, all this. It's very easy to please Prabhupada. He doesn't make it difficult. Okay. Krishna Karshan, he says, Go shy. I call you, I'm going to call you Go Shy Krishna Karshan. Self controlled Krishna Karshan. Her name's Gosia. Is that how you pronounce it? Gosia. Margajavrata. <laughs> I make up Sanskrit names for your Polish name. Um, we need self acceptance. We need self acceptance. But what is healthy and what is unhealthy is self-acceptance. Uh, unhealthy self-acceptance is you go out and do some horrible things and you just say, oh, it's just the way I am. I have to accept myself. Healthy self-acceptance is you, you're you normally fallen. You're like, your anarthas, your challenges are just normal, which everyone has. And you're trying to improve them. And so that's healthy self-acceptance. So, um, it's important to know, I've said this before, but I don't think I could ever say this enough again, that I just said, you know, your normal, accept your normal cha challenges, which, which are normal. But the problem is, many of us think that our challenges are not normal. They, we think that no one has the same challenges, or we think no one has the same degree that, of challenges that we have. Okay, I know everybody's struggling with this and everybody's got false ego and everybody's attached to this and that. But mine is worse. And if you get 100 people in the room, I would guess that more than half would say mine is the worst of anyone in the room. It's true because I've tested this out in seminars and I've discussed this and everyone pretty much comes to realize if you present this in the proper way that they think they're uniquely troubled with maya more so than anyone else and you know in certain areas you may be more troubled than your god brother or god sister with one thing but not with everything but but also the problem is it becomes an excuse you know, Prabhu, I'm really fallen, you know, my childhood was like this and this body is really lusty and you know, then it becomes the excuse just to give in to it. And excuses will destroy you. 
And if you want to become Krishna conscious, then you have to see excuses for what they are. It's just maya is trying to get you to rationalize. So you give up trying, or so you lower your standards. So when I say self-acceptance, I mean for you know standard normal challenges. You know, I'm proud, I'm greedy, I'm lusty, I'm attached. Okay, I'm working all these things. Not that I go out and kill somebody and just go, well, you know, I have to be self-accepting. Hmm. But even if you fall into some bad habit and say, you know, well, circumst you know, a lot of I was just talking to John yesterday and he said a lot of the drug addictions happen because doctors give out drugs. You know, heroin lace drugs. And they give them out easily and then they become available and some people get them from their doctors and sell them. And so, you know, you may circumstantially end up addicted to something. But, you know, obviously it's not good. But sometimes these things happen. And so, from that point, we don't want to destroy ourselves by beating ourselves up. We want to look for solutions. So, my realization of self-acceptance is that where there's healthy self-acceptance, it allows you to look for solutions. Where, there, where there's... um not healthy self-acceptance, you kind of just dwell in the problem and in the excuses. It's, it's a very mode of ignorance type thing, so you don't move forward. With self-acceptance, we had talked about this, I think last week or the week before, and as I was explaining this, I was realizing or maybe reminding myself that if you don't have self-acceptance, it's very difficult to be steady. It's very difficult to maintain enthusiasm because lack of self-acceptance just it just undermines all your enthusiasm, undermines your happiness in Krishna consciousness, undermines your patience. And it just puts you in the mode of ignorance where basically you lament for your fallen condition. And the more you, you lament for your fallen condition, the more you become kind of just think, well, what's the use? Why try as I keep falling? Or self-acceptance can help you get over that. Okay, this is how I am. I'm working on, I'm doing better. So the idea of self-acceptance is if I accept where I'm at now, then I can work on doing better. That's the idea. And often when you don't accept yourself, then you don't try to do better. Okay, this is where I am. To be expected, I'm a bona fide conditioned soul. Got all the qualifications of a conditioned soul. But let's move forward. Let's make this work. Let's become Krishna conscious. You need a sufficient degree of self-acceptance to be able to think that way. That's why it's so important. That's, I made this point before. I don't know if you picked up on it. But that's why it's so important. Because if you don't have a sufficient degree of self-acceptance, you just become discouraged or depressed. And then you lose your energy to fight, and it's a battle. Humility is not a synonym for depression. The next video. Yes, it will be done. Except I took all my lights down yesterday. I can put them back up, but you know, I was I've often I often thought that the best time to make the videos is right after the class because I just talked about it. Some of the videos I made were like two weeks after we talked about it. It's like, hmm, what were you talking about? Hmm, hmm, hmm. So I don't know <laughs> if I communicated it as well two weeks later. So maybe when I finish, I'll go in, set all the lights up, or I, I can just make it in the phone like this. That it just sit here and do it. That might be easier. Do you think a low self-esteem person can be humble and not end up depressed? They need to be guided how to do that. Because the problem is, if you have low self-esteem, it's really hard. You feel bad about yourself, so it's hard to look at your faults because it makes you feel worse. You know, when the pure devotees look at their faults, it makes them feel more how much more they need Krishna. I have so many faults, Krishna, I need you more. So that's how we're supposed to feel. You look at your faults and they go, oh, 
I'm a mess, Krishna, I really need you. I need you more than I thought. It doesn't discourage them from their from their progress. So if you see your faults, it should make you feel, oh, I really need Krishna consciousness more. Let me become more of a devotee. But somehow or other, we can't let our load of faults weigh us down. And I think some people don't get weighed down by them. It's like it's like the low self-esteem person and the person with without low self-esteem, they both have the same faults, more or less. And they both have the same weight of faults, but it weighs one down and it doesn't weigh the other down. So I think that's important to understand. It's, if you have low self-esteem, it's not like your situation is unique. It isn't. It's just that you're allowing, allowing yourself to get weighed down by it. And humility is important because we need to see what to work on. And humility is important because if we're proud, then pride is our imitation of Krishna. So we have to have healthy humility. And healthy humility is Krishna conscious humility. Unhealthy humility would be mixed with low self-esteem. And I feel bad to look at myself and and... I mean, I can I can say from my own perspective. I'll just share my own realization. Maybe this will help you. Uh, sometimes when devotees are serving me or they want to become disciples, they they feel concerned that they have many bad qualities or many failings, or they're not Krishna conscious as Krishna conscious as they feel they should be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes when they have problems, they don't want to write me because they feel embarrassed and they feel they're letting me down. And I always tell them that the only thing that I really see in the disciple, whether they're doing well or not well, is if they're sincere. Because if I have a disciple who's who's doing well, but I don't perceive that they're really sincere, I... I would view the disciple who's struggling, who's sincere, with in a better position, in a sense, and with less judgment. Because if I see someone's not sincere, even though they're doing service nicely, they may be doing it for the wrong reason. And I would be concerned. Oh, I'm concerned about this devotee because this is not good. Whereas if someone is struggling more, but they have the right attitude, I'm less concerned because I know because they have the right attitude, they'll be successful. And because also it's a relationship, you see, you have a relationship with your guru. So the relationship is not based on your qualification, how smart you are, how capable you are. No relationships are based on that unless it's in the workplace with your boss or something, but this is different. So it's it's based on affection, sincerity, ser- you know, serving together, helping one another. That's what it's based on. It's not based on your qualifications. So if a devotee is sincerely serving, we have a very good relationship, despite the fact that that they may think they're not very qualified or they may think they don't have good qualities. I don't even notice. I'm just being honest. I'm not being proud. I just want devotees to know this. And I, I, I would speak for all gurus, not just speaking for those who are my disciples, but I would speak for all gurus. They that's that's not what they notice. Of course, if you have some important service and you know you lose a million dollars because of your negligence, okay, that, we're not talking about that. That obviously would be upsetting. But we're talking about in general that when I see a devotee is sincere, even though they're struggling, it doesn't have it doesn't do anything to what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't do any, it doesn't disturb the relationship. Because it's a it's a real relationship, you know. There's a fa- and you can see this devotee's he has affection. She has affection for her guru. They're trying. They're doing their best. Now the guru is, is very favorable. The guru is very favorable, very loving, and just appreciates that devotee. Has a lot of affection for that devotee. And the devotee's thinking, oh, my guru must not like me because. I'm not good at this and that, and I can't do what the other devotees are doing. You know, it's not like that at all. Because it's a relationship, and relationships don't work that way. It's like, you know, you have five kids, and so the the kids that get the better grades, oh, those are the kids you like. Or, you know, I'm a musician, so the kids 
that play music, those are the kids I like. The ones that don't play music, nah, forget them. Or I'm a, I'm a whatever, I'm a scholar, so I like the kids that get the good grades. I'm an athlete, yeah. My kids that play sports, I like them. And the better they play sports, the better I like them. If, if someone told you that, wouldn't you think that was weird? You know, I said, you know, how do you, you like your kids? You know, you have so many kids, you love them equally. No, I, I love the ones that play sports. The other ones, I don't care. They can do whatever they want. They can hang out with their mother and, you know, like sew clothes or cook. But, you know, the boys who play sports, or this girl, she plays sports. You know, she's my favorite. She's the best. You would think, this guy, something's wrong. There's something wrong with him, wouldn't you? So why would it be different with a guru and disciples? So I think it's, it's important that devotees know that. And if you're having trouble, then that's the time to go to the guru, not to, to hide from the guru because you're embarrassed to tell him your trouble. You know, and then he finds out your trouble after you crash. Well, he could have saved you before you crashed. But you're thinking, well, I don't want to tell him because then he'll know what I'm like. He already knows what you're like. Don't worry about it, you know. Um, I get, here's, here's a typical letter. Guru Maharaj, I haven't written you in a long time because I was embarrassed because I wasn't doing well. My typical response, I know you weren't doing well because you didn't write. That's the first indication. The ones who are doing well, they write, they tell me what they're doing. The ones who don't do well, they don't tell me what they're doing. That's how I know. Oh, I haven't heard from so-and-so in a long time. Red flag, red flag. Let me write and let me call them. How are you doing? What's going on? Oh, oh, go rush. Oh, oh. And you wouldn't have to do. Oh, oh. If you would have told me that three months ago, we could have like nipped it in the bud. So that a lot of that is connected with, you know, just embarrassment. It may be low self-esteem, whatever you want to call it. But don't think your guru is judging you on that level. That's a big mistake. And it can cause you lots of problems because you don't reach out to get help, or if not from your guru, someone else that can help you. Priyamvadha, now known as Priyamadava, says, Priyamadava is also okay. And I do struggle with everything you mentioned, every single thing you mentioned. Yes. I felt like you were just <laughs> listing everything. I struggle with how self-esteem I, I always told you I know everything. No, but what what this proves is that what I'm saying is you not is not unique. That's that so many people struggle with it. So don't think your problems are unique. Um, I struggle with low self esteem, perfection, etc. Thank you so much for this answer. I work on myself. Yeah. So I think that's important. We can emphasize that fact. Is this is not. It's not just you. It's like this is common. It's ep it's actually epidemic, pandemic actually. Perfectionism, the lack of patience, etc. Yeah. These are either brought into this life from past lives, or they're we've learned them in this life. As a rule, if you find anything in yourself that is not conducive to bhakti, then work. You need to work on it because it's just an obstacle on the path. And like in marriage, sometimes you'll find, sometimes you'll find after you get married that, that you have a particular trait that you didn't notice, and it becomes more obvious in marriage. And previously, you didn't have to work on it because it wasn't a problem in your workplace or it wasn't a problem with your friends, but now that you're married, it's a problem. So it's something like that, that when you become Krishna conscious, you have a relationship and now you'll see some things are problems, and so don't just let those go by and say, oh, what can I do about it, or just lament about them, but just take note that I need to work on this. And it's and, and again, it's okay to have problems. Here's another mantra coming in. It's okay to have problems, it's just not okay to do nothing about them. I think I actually did a video. The problem is, I think I do topics on the same thing over and I forget. Anyway, let me write that down. I've probably done this before, but... It's not bad to have problems, it's just bad not to do anything about them. 
So if you want to, if you want to like beat yourself up, at least beat yourself up for not doing anything about your tendency to beat yourself up. Yes. Should I say that again? If you want to beat yourself up, at least beat yourself up about your tendency to beat yourself up. That you can beat yourself up about. That you can feel bad about. You can feel bad about problems that you do nothing about. But once you start working, once you start working on your problems, I do not give you permission to feel bad about them, okay? I will not give you I give you permission to feel bad about things that you're not working on because that will help you work on them. But once you work on them, I don't give you permission to feel bad about them because then you can't work on them successfully if you feel bad about them. I can't do this. Okay, I have to learn. I have to learn how to play the piano, right? <laughs> the note. That's so hard. Oh, I don't know this one. See, oh, oh, so bad. Been playing this so many years, I can't even play the scales with my eyes closed. It's so bad. What's the use? I hate this. Right? There you go, right? And um, that's the perfectionist, right? I hate it, you know, just get rid of it. So if you have that tendency, then you should feel bad about having that tendency so you correct it, right? That's the only reason to feel bad. But if you have that tendency, if you, if you do what I just did, then you just think, okay, we need to work on this. Sim it's so simple. It sounds stupid. We even have to talk about it, right? Yeah, just work. Okay, I don't do it well enough. That means here's a problem. I realize I have a problem. I can't play the scales with my eyes closed. I need to learn. And and if I go in the flats scales, I don't even know them. because I never studied this. I just play tunes on harmonium. That's it. So if I go to play the flat scales, I'm completely, I don't even know how to play them. No. I'm so bad at this. Okay, I need to practice this. I need to get better. I can do this. I just haven't practiced it. Now I know I have this problem. I never even thought about it those scales because I never play in those keys but there's one scale okay, it's time for some fun it's the scale of G flat if you, if you want to do a kirtan just play the black keys I'm just playing black keys it's just Let's sing any note, you'll have a cure time. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hey, look at that. I can play, I can play in the key of G minor. I'm amazing. Look how well I can play. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Rama, Hare Rama. Wow, I'm amazing. So give yourself credit. Okay, you know, I can do this. It just takes some work. That That's how you do it. So you can feel bad about something that's holding you back, like beating yourself up. Yeah, feel bad about beating yourself up and stop doing it. You don't have per I don't give you permission. If you're trying to improve, you do not have my permission to feel bad. And if you ever write me a letter and say, I feel bad, 
about something and you're trying, I will write back and say, you do not have my permission to feel bad. You're not allowed. It's against the order of, of the superiors. Hare Krishna. Okay. Puna. Puna. Puna, Puna. Puna, Puna. We're like a dragon head. You cut one head in this place, few more growing. You are asking for one question <laughs> in this place. A few more are rising. We're answering one question and we get, you know, it's like Robin has had, we get ten more. Welcome, Charlene. So I make fun of my mother for naming me Puna. She had a daughter again. That's why she named me that. Oh, one daughter was named Puna, and then she had another daughter. It's like Puna again, two Punas. That is so funny. Puna, Puna, Charvi to Charvananam. That verse, you know that verse, Bhagavatam? Again and again, chewing the chewed. Uh, Sankita says, Love just what you said. It's blessings to hear. From, uh, it's like Lord answers so many questions without question. <laughs> Well, you know, when you speak on Krishna's behalf, sometimes Krishna inspires you to speak what devotees need to hear. Krishna is not a complaining or a nagging parent. Okay. Not a nagging parent. Yeah, that's important. Which is great if you have really like loving parents then you'll tendency of everybody think of Krishna as a loving God, which he is. Half people say, I have tons of problems. The other half will say, I have no problems. They're both wrong. Many devotees struggle with emotional and even psychological issues. The issues often have detrimental impact on their spiritual life. And relationships, yes. Do you think that devotees should go do you think that devotees should go for a therapist or just pray to Krishna for help? Mongaru said that psychology is Maya. I would not mention his name. Totally disagree with him. Um, you have to qualify what yeah, of course we should pray to Krishna. But just like John, John and I were speaking yesterday, that there are devotees who have addictions. And they came to Krishna consciousness, and you know the addictions obviously were not that deep, or their conviction and faith and execution of Krishna consciousness was so deep that they overcame that addiction. They stopped smoking, taking drugs, maybe alcohol. But... In most cases, they were not deeply addicted. They were just party addicted, you know, weekend addicted. And they're addicted to psychedelic drugs, which are not physically addicting, even even not that psychologically addicting. And they came to Krishna consciousness and stopped. And I stopped doing all that. I didn't even try. I just stopped it. Krishna consciousness was better. So in the recovery movement, the idea is that you can't do it on your own, that you need God to help you. So when the addiction gets to the point where you are you feel powerless, you can't do anything, you need God to help you. So that is called God help as opposed to self-help. And so obviously we can't say no, and we can't even say that's not the superior way. And I think that any devotee who would use psychology to help them would not do it independent of their understanding their dependence on Krishna or would not use it in any way independently. So when someone says psychology is, is maya, we have to know exactly what psychology are they talking about and in, in what arena was it maya? Because in many arenas it, it cures people of serious traumas and issues. I've seen this, like, you know, especially childhood issues. 
or abu- issues of abuse. And so what you call it psychology therapy, I think sometimes it's semantics that they were talking about different things. A lot of times when devotees argue, they're arguing about something and they realize they both agree because they were just defining it differently. And they go, oh, if that's what you mean by this, oh, then I agree with you. I thought you meant that. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying, man? You hear me? Hear what I'm saying? So... If you define psychology as understanding the nature of the mind, and, well, in the Vedas there's psychology, which is basically how the modes of nature are influencing you, then we can't really say psychology is maya because it's right. It's the three modes of nature. And Pantanjali's Yoga Sutras are all about the mind. Yoga is all about the mind. So what we would need some qualification what that person means. I can't answer that. But in... I, I think also what might be funny, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned to you a week or two ago, that a lot of times in the classes I used to give to the Sankirtan devotees to inspire them, unbeknownst to me, I was teaching what Tony Robbins at the same time. I'm, I'm giving my class to the Sankirtan devotees in 1979, you know, in Los Angeles, firing them up with enthusiasm and inspiration. And down in Santa Monica somewhere, Tony Robbins is giving his, like, big, you know, seminar. And we're saying the same thing, and I never even heard him. So you could say, oh, this Tony Robbins is, you know, it's a bunch of nonsense. But the fact is that every Sankirtan leader has said many things that he says. They're just principles of of how the world, there's just laws of how the world works, of how the mind works. So to say it's Maya, we need to, there may be aspects of psychology we could say are Maya. They're, they're, they're atheistic, they have principles in them, karma conduct principles. So, yeah, we could say that. But in general, to say that would be false. And as I said uh, to you before, one time Prabhupada was asked about something and. and Devotee said, well, is it Maya? Or the devotee said, is this Maya? Or he was saying, isn't this Maya? And Prabhupada said, everything is Maya. But when you engage in Krishna service, then it's Krishna. So, is this Maya? Well, if it's not engaged in Krishna service, yeah. And so then the question is, can you engage psychology in Krishna service? Can you help a devotee? Have I helped devotees using psychology? Yeah, I've helped a lot of devotees. I've helped devotees in ways that I don't think I could have helped them if I didn't understand some basic principles of human nature. Now, someone might say, but you could get that all from the Vedas. That Maybe I could. We were just having a discussion yesterday that there's a need to systematize Prabhupada's books. In other words, you want to learn something, and sometimes you don't really think that Prabhupada's talked about it or talked much about it, where if someone studies it, so, well, here's everything Prabhupada said, now let's put it in order, let's make sense out of it, let's summarize it, what are the points he's making, what are the principles, and then you can read like this 50-page document, this is what Prabhupada says about this. I think that would that would make things more clear, and I, and I think a lot of times we just say, no, this is Maya, or this is good, or this is bad, and we don't really know exactly everything Prabhupada said about it. So I think that's part of the problem. And, I mean, I can show you things that Prabhupada says that are the same things that psychologists say. So to say psycho- psychology is Maya, well, it's anything not used for Krishna is Maya. So in that sense, yeah, it is. But when you can use it for Krishna, it's not. And I've seen, um, just like the self-esteem. Now, do we, would this devotee say that helping devotees with low self-esteem is maya? Because it's, it's part, it comes under the umbrella of psychology. I don't think so, because as we were saying, if you, if you look at how Prabhupada dealt with devotees, he dealt with devotees in a way that would really build their self-esteem. And, he, and Prabhupada talked about taking care of yourself. There's a couple questions about loving yourself even, and that Prabhupada was talking about. So these are very, very much 
you know, self-love is a very much a, a modern psychological term. And Prabhupada used that self-love, self-hate, self-envy. So if you study psychology, you'll see there are many similarities in, in what is being said. And I've studied a little bit. I have a book called Ayurveda and Psychology, and it talks about the nature of psychology according to the bodily, bodily type and how diet and exercise can change the, psycho, the change the mind. So the mind being the steering wheel, it certainly seems that we should do everything we can to help devotees steer it. Now someone might say, well, don't use modern secular methods, use the Vedic methods. Okay, that's fine. As long as someone can, you know, I've read books by devotees on Vedic psychology, and to be 100% honest with you, it was so convoluted, I couldn't really, there, it, was, it was just philosophical, impractical, and yeah, it was too philosophical. So, you know, if there's a training book of counseling based on the Vedic, Vedic psychology, yeah, why we should use that. That's our, but I don't see that. So then we, you know, so we go with what we can go and then we Krishnaize it and then we apply what we know about Krishna consciousness, what we know about the modes of nature into that and try to make some sense from it. And you can see, you can see often when I talk about something psychological, I'm always relating it to the modes of nature like we did today. This, you know, I'm so bad and that, that depression that comes with that, that's all tamagun. And when you get in satvagun, you don't feel that way. You know, self-acceptance, purity, clarity, productivity, that's sattvic, and that's where we want to be. So, it's 9.30, everyone, and I am so inspired now, I am going to go make a video. And it's going to be called, Krishna is not like your parents. Krishna is not, we'll call it, Krishna is not a nagging, like a nagging parent. And so, Satyarupa, are you there? Can you save these questions? We'll have maybe we'll have so many questions, we'll never get to. Wow, we have a lot. So she's going to save them for tomorrow, not for tomorrow for Friday. Okay. Katie says some devotees need help from a therapist. Katie knows. Um, Gabriella is a therapist. She ought to know. She helps devotees. She, you know, Gabriella's. John is a, a professor of counseling and a former Jesu Jesuit, so he's uh, eminently qualified to answer this question. I've seen counseling therapy psychology tools help clear away the junk so that folks get a glimpse of God in the soul and then attraction builds. Important to find the right helper. There's your answer. So my... My assumption is that when devotees say something like that, they're referring either to a particular form of psychology that would not be helpful. Maybe it's something they were told. Some oh, devotees are going to this program and they teach them this and that. And he goes, oh, that's all bogus. But hasn't really studied the realm of psychology and how it helps. God help versus self-help. Okay. Actually, I just did... Uh, a video more or less on that topic. Maybe exactly on that topic. Because so I tend to talk about similar things. Mm -hmm. Since I started practicing Krishna, this is Gabrielle, she's a psychologist, a master's in psychology. Uh, my levels of self-demand have increased greatly as well as the quest for perfection. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful class, for a reminding what's most important. So this is really good. Thank you, Gabriella, for saying this. So Gabriella is saying exactly what I said. You become a devotee, there's this level of perfection above you, and, and, and you want to strive for it. And Gabriella, the, what, the other place where it really has, uh, wreaks havoc is when you get married, because then you expect your husband to be the ideal husband, as you've read in Bhagavatam. He expects you to be the ideal wife that he reads in Bhagavatam, and the chances are neither of you are even close to that. 
I mean, you can work on it. And the chances are that neither of you may even want it to do that. You know, the ideal, yes, Prabhu, whatever you say, I will do. You know, some women, that's like, that's like the ultimate goal of life. They just, they just want to serve their husband. That's what they want to do. That just, that's everything for them. There's nothing higher. And some women are like, no, I want to have a career. And, just, and my husband's okay, but he can cook sometimes and clean the house. I don't want to do it all. So, you know, you have to come to grips with that reality. <laughs> you once said it's okay to have problems, but it's bad to have the same problems all the time. Yeah, it's okay to have a problem once, not again and again. It's okay to have problems. It's not okay to not do anything about them. Yeah. Yeah, that's what the video is going to be about today. It's amazing. I turn on the camera. I have no idea what I'm going to say, and I just start talking, and it just comes out. We're actually going through your questions backwards. Maybe we won't have any for tomorrow. Yeah. John says, sometimes we try to remember that Krishna can see everything in my heart and then think that if Krishna accepts me with all the stuff, even though so much work is there. That feels like mercy, yeah. Yeah, that is mercy. Yes, okay, I better stop. No, I think I got everything. I think we covered. I recommend devotees um, study psychology if they have the inclination to become counselors, therapists, because more and more devotees are coming to ISKCON now. Kali Yuga has made a lot of progress. As I said, Kali has arrived ahead of schedule. The flight carrying Kali personified is arriving early, about 5,000 years early, actually. So we're starting, <laughs> not 5,000, but a few thousand. We're starting to see latter-day symptoms of Kali Yuga in the present day. They're not supposed to be happening. So we're, we're, a lot of people joining ISKCON are coming with a lot of baggage, and we need devotees who can help them. Okay, so we're going to stop. I'm going to run in and make a video because I'm so excited. And today's Wednesday. Wednesday means at 12 o'clock, which is in 2 hours and 22 minutes, we do japa. And the address is on Facebook, and we do it on Friday also. You're all invited. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Gopramanandi Hari Hari Bol.